everyone. This is Nikki Uy from the Food Trust. Um, welcome to our webinar, uh, Faith in Food, Partnering with Congregations to Sustain and Strengthen Communities Through Farmers Markets. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Nikki Uy and I work at the Food Trust. Um, and I'm presenting today uh, with my colleague, Joshua Castaño from Partners for Sacred Places. And we'd like to thank the Farmers Market Coalition for uh, hosting today's webinar. So I work at the Food Trust. It's a uh, food access not-for-profit organization that's existed since 1992. Um, at the Food Trust, uh, we work on a comprehensive approach, uh, working with different aspects of the community's foodscape. For instance, we do food education with children and adults at classrooms and community settings. We connect, um, we connect communities to um, local food through schools and healthy food incentive programs. We also promote wellness through community health and youth leadership uh, through community events and initiatives like our HYPE program and our Night Market Philadelphia program. And of course, uh, the Food Trust helps make healthy food affordable and easy to find through healthy retailing at supermarkets, corner stores, and farmers markets, which we're going to focus on um, today. So the Food Trust Farmers Market Program has been in existence since 1993. We currently op operate 25 farmers markets in the greater Philadelphia area, and we partner with locations across the city and Philly Food Bucks. We have around uh, over 100 partners, but work closely with about 30. Um, and we accept all kinds of benefits at the farmers markets, including SNAP, sometimes called EBT, food box, and senior and WIC farmers market nutrition program benefits. Um, a little bit of history about our farmers market program. Um, our farmers market uh, was located in Tasker Homes, um, low income housing in South Philadelphia. We opened that in 1993. Um, we've been a leader in accepting EBT at farmers markets since the early 2000s, so we've gone through a few of those point-of-sale machines. Um, our largest period of growth was in 2010 and 2011 in partnership with the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, and it was funded by Communities Putting Prevention to Work Stimulus Funds. And that really allowed us to open 10 farmers markets in high-priority zip codes. Um, these are zip codes with the highest level of poverty, uh, with low to no access to food. Um, it also allowed us to start our Philly Food Box program, which is our coupon incentive program for SNAP shoppers. Um, currently, the Food Trust operates over 80% of farmers markets um, in low to mixed income communities um, with little access to um, high quality produce. And currently, we have a few USDA grants that support our work um, around promotion of Philly Food Box, EBT, and SNAP. And um, we also have one uh, that allows us to strengthen our partnerships with faith communities, um, which is what we are presenting on today. Um, when connecting farmers markets to congregants, um, we learned a few things over the past couple of years working on this project. Um, it's important to know your audience, like always when operating farmers markets, and um, one of the key points we learned was um, operating farmers markets at locations and during times that are most convenient to shoppers and congregants. Um, we also found that it was very helpful to connect to existing programs hosted by um, the faith communities and houses of worship, such as feeding programs, volunteer engagement programs um, can be a great way to get some folks down to the market, um, and also any after school or other programs for children we thought was a great way to connect um, congregants to uh, the market. Um, we also uh, felt that developing program at the market that um, congregants could participate in was very successful um, and we did this uh, through a few different ways, um, cooking demonstration, customer appreciation days which we promoted uh, through the Houses of Worship, and also market tours. Um, we accept a wide variety of benefits at the farmers markets. Um, for instance, we take SNAP, uh, and sometimes called EBT. We take farmers market nutrition program vouchers that are given to seniors and WIC mothers. Um, and we also uh, accept Philly Food Bucks. And the Philly Food Bucks are um, a coupon incentive program that we offer to our, our SNAP shoppers. For every $5 that uh, somebody spends on their 
SNAP card, they get a $2 coupon for fruits and vegetables. There's no cap. Um, if folks spend $100 of, on their EBT benefits at market, they get $40 back at the spend on fruits and vegetables. Um, we currently work with over 100 Philly Food Buck community partners across the city. Uh, the criteria for partnership um, are that they serve a majority of their clients who are SNAP eligible. Um, it's helpful if they're located within 10 blocks of a redemption site. And um, you know, we also require that the program promotes healthy eating habits and physical activity. Um, as I mentioned, cooking demonstrations have been really popular in our farmers markets. They welcome and draw people to the market. Uh, we demonstrate a healthy recipe. We introduce new fruits and vegetables that can be found at the market. Everybody gets to taste the food. There's a lot of sampling at market. Um, and it's also really great to be able to smell the food and just um, kind of ask questions and see the whole thing happening in front of you. All the participants receive Philly food bucks. We also do a lot of farmer's market tours, which um, lately we've been calling farmer's market walks. Um, it kind of introduces um, customers to the farmer's markets, uh, we, to the farmers, and we kind of uh, let folks know that it's unlike other places where you might buy your food. Um, the farmer is really happy to answer any questions you have. Um, here's a group of kids that uh, we had brought over to uh, one of the farmers markets. We typically have fun activities that are tailored to um, the group attending. Um, he also receives six dollars in Philly food bucks and um, uh, frequently when we have groups with children like this the parents come along too and so we talk to them about how, about how they can receive more Philly food bucks by shopping with their EBT card. Um, we also survey participants at the end of the market tours. So those were some of the ways that the Food Trust um, works with the faith community, but certainly there are a lot of other food access organizations um, that work with faith communities. Uh, and I've listed a few of the Philadelphia-based one, ones here. Um, Greensboro, Pennypack Farm, Share, and Farm to Families all offer affordable CSAs and food boxes that can be paid uh, for using SNAP benefits. Um, there are also commercial kitchens um, hosted in churches and other houses of worship. Greensboro has one. Um, and all, of course, a lot of um, faith communities are hosting community gardens and urban farms. So we had a question for the audience. Um, we were kind of wondering if you're currently working with the faith community, and if you are, how so, um, or whether you would like to uh, in the future. Um, so I think Liz has put a poll, uh, has kept the poll open. And folks can, can kind of um, enter in your answers. Um, it should be appearing in front of your screen. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like the um, the responses are, are split down the middle. Oh, wow. I don't know if you can see that, Nikki, but it's, yep. uh, yeah, it's 50% yes, 43% would like to in the future, and 7% said no. Okay. That's great. That's great to hear. So it's great to hear that a lot of people are already connected to the faith community, um, but that there's also a lot of potential, um, a lot more potential in this kind of work. So I'm going to resume the slideshow. Okay. So I wanted to highlight a couple of um, the houses of worship that we worked with um, at this project. Uh, the first one was at 26 in Allegheny at the Devereaux United Methodist Church. Um, this is a faith community that um, Josh's organization, Partners for Sacred Places, uh, helped us identify as one that would um, consider the farmer's market as something that is going to enhance their mission. Um, they really felt like this was something that would um, 
be an additional benefit to their community um, and they had the capacity to be able to support the farmers market. Um, we did run into a couple of uh, challenges. One was affordability and um, this is in an area where um, where people have tight budgets and so uh, we were able to address this by um, doing a lot of Philly Food Bucks outreach in those areas and with the uh, church programs um, and also advertising that we take um, the farmers market nutrition program vouchers. Um, advertising and consistent patronage was also a challenge um, so we worked very hard with the church and other surrounding community groups um, around that. Some of the successes that we had was partnering with a meals program that um, Deborah United Methodist Church runs. Um, they have a very committed staff there who is also very committed to the farmers uh, market. And so we work with them closely um, to host the farmers markets uh, on days where they were running their meals program. Another thing that worked really well was tours with youth. We connected with our um, HYPE program here in, uh, at the Food Trust, which works with youth in Philadelphia, um, and they were able to bring um, older youth down, high school students, down to the farmer's market uh, for a tour. Um, and I ran into some, some of the students who attended the tour like a couple of weeks later, and they were telling me about how much they enjoyed it, which really, um, to me, says something about the power of um, these tours. They seem to leave a lasting impression. Uh, and cooking demos were also something that we found very popular at this location and others. Um, here's a picture of our farmer's market outside um, the Road of Shalom Synagogue. It's our common ground market. Um, one of the challenges that we ran into at this location uh, was the day of the week. Um, originally, the farmer's market was located on a Sunday, which, um, you know, the, really when we had worked with this community, they wanted the farmer's market to uh, be inclusive of um, the many faith communities that are in this area. And um, so we received feedback from the other churches saying that Sunday might not be the most uh, conducive day of the week for shopping for them. So we, uh, we're trying a weekday now market. So um, another challenge that we have in this neighborhood is that it, it is changing neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of um, younger folks moving in, young families, and um, it's it's um, a challenge, but um, also allows us to diversify the market to be able to include um, products that serve both the existing community there and also the new folks who are moving in. So some of the successes we've had at this location um, is the volunteer engagement. The Road of Shalom Synagogue has um, a huge congregation um, and a very active community um, that's allowed us to do a lot of diverse programming at the farmers market over there. They have an extended cooking demonstration season. We've had um, salsa dance lessons there and line dancing lessons. We have a lot of community groups who um, table at the market and we do we run um, urban tours out of that location. We run tours out of that location to urban farms. Um, there's a rooftop garden near that location and a few other places that um, folks can do a bike tour to and also a walking tour. Of. Um, and as I mentioned, cooking demonstrations have really been kind of the most popular um, programming initiative that we've, that's really been drawing people um, on a regular basis to our markets. And now I'm going to turn over the presentation to Josh. Joshua? Okay, so uh, I guess we're looking at the next slide, and everything's okay. I'm just sort of asking my colleagues here. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone, uh, for being with us today. Um, I just wanted to describe a little bit about um, what congregations do and how they're working on issues related to um, food and nutrition and um, contributing to the really good work that organizations like the Food Trust are trying to accomplish um, so that this information can be helpful in thinking about how to connect with congregations and effectively develop partnerships with them. I was really encouraged from the poll that we already have uh, 
at least from the people who are attending today's session, uh, at least half of you are already working with congregations. And so that's really wonderful. Hopefully today we'll um, give you some new ideas or some information that will be um, helpful in terms of strengthening those partnerships or increasing them. And for those who are interested in working with congregations, it'll um, hopefully be uh, a good start in terms of developing uh, a partnership or a relationship with them. Uh, you know, food is really important to congregations in so many ways. Um, and the way that they relate to community. I want to just pause for a second and say that um, about 15 years ago, Partners did its first major national research project on what we call the community or public value of, of congregations in the United States. And that study looked at over 100 congregations um, that were in historic buildings in cities across the nation. And the conclusion of that study was revealing uh, surprising and really powerful and we've done additional research since then and the conversation nationally has really increased but the one of the great facts from the that set of conclusions was that for the average historic church in a city here in the United States that 81 percent 81 percent of the people who pass through the doors of that church every week are not members of the congregation. So churches are doing, uh, especially older churches, sometimes with very small membership, sometimes with very limited resources, uh, financially speaking, are actually accomplishing a lot of incredible work and contributing to the community in really significant ways. And there's sort of a list there of common ones, some of which you've heard about through the programs that the Food Trust has sponsored. Um, and this is a great photo of actually some Bhutanese refugees who were connected with the church in Romhurst because they were really interested in continuing their traditional um, agriculture, growing crops that were familiar to them, being able to just work on land because they were adjusting to urban life and not actually having land that they could be in touch with and work. And so that was one uh, particular partnership that was pretty interesting. And uh, hopefully a kind of a creative way to think about um, partnerships with congregations around food. Uh, you know, food is also, I, I don't want to overlook this, even though it, it may seem less related to the core of what we're talking about today, but I think it helps us really understand um, what happens within congregations, who they are as institutions, um, and what their life is like as a community. Is food is so integral and so important to what they're doing uh, in their own work internally, through fellowship, um, even through liturgy, and in a number of different ways. So food is, is really a part of the, the life of congregations. So we have a question, and, and we talked about asking questions during this presentation that, that you might have, but also questions that um, we have uh, for you. If you have a chance, you can, you know, at any time, write your questions and we'll talk about them at the end. But one of the things that we were thinking about is sort of just a general thought is um, how food does actually help make connections between people, um, you know, in all of these different ways, gathering, cooking, growing, preparing, eating, sharing, and for churches, you know, worship. Uh, a really great congregation we want to highlight in terms of partnership was uh, Solid Rock United Methodist um, in the only section of Philadelphia. Um, this was a church that was really, is really on fire to connect with the community and use their really beautiful, ample physical assets of their historic building and all of the square footage and kinds of spaces that it had in terms of um, making partnership work. A lot of the churches that we deal with here in Philadelphia um, especially the older historic ones, are really interesting. They have a lot of different kinds of space. Um, mo many of them have kitchens. A lot of those kitchens um, in some cases have um, appliances that were commercial grade when they were installed or um, you know they have the size that can you know f where meals that can feed a large number of people can be prepared. Um, a lot of them have sometimes recreational space like a gym or a multi-purpose space that can 
serve both recreational and gathering space. They have smaller spaces like classrooms and offices. Um, they have different types of worship space, which itself can be used for gathering. Uh, sometimes there are churches that, that are blessed to have a parking lot. Um, there's lots of different physical assets there, and I, I just want us on the community side as well to be aware of that. And sometimes to help encourage congregations, I think this is important, to think about the assets that they have. Um, because in many cases, our historic churches here in the city of Philadelphia and in other um, older cities across the nation um, have an abundance of underutilized um, or unused space. And a lot of those ancillary spaces might be really helpful to the kinds of additional projects and programs that round out the full um, sense of what a market, for instance, is, be, is able to add to a local community. Um, all of the additional projects and, and programs that um, Nikki mentioned earlier in this presentation, those kinds of things can really take advantage of all of the other assets that um, congregations have and can leverage them in new and different ways that maybe they hadn't even thought about or that we hadn't thought about um, in approaching it. Um, the really the really important first step in terms of approaching a partnership with a congregation is to think about the fit and whether or not the values and the energy um, and the interest really align on both sides. Um, some congregations are really passionate and focused on um, community serving programs and are really responding or trying to respond and aware of the needs in the local community around food, around education, around um, economic opportunity, etc. And so they're eager to partner with an organization that is focused on the same issue and has the tools and the skills and the capacity to address it and can partner with the congregation by leveraging some of those the assets the congregation has and uh, working together um, on a particular project. Other congregations may be less aware of what's going on around them. Um, they may be interested but they may not have um, the sense internally about how to respond or how to partner. It doesn't mean they're not a good fit but it means that they might need some help thinking through that conversation. Other congregations, to be honest, and, and these are you know probably the fewest in number, um, may not be focused on the same goals, or it may not have the same values around um, specific issues in the community. And so they're probably less likely to be successful partners because they're just not as focused. It's not central to their understanding of their role in the community, and it's not part of their vision for what they want to accomplish in the community. So it's really, it's really important to think through what we call the mission and vision alignment. And that's a really important first step in having the conversation with the congregation's members and leaders around why um, the development of a market might work and why it might support their role in the community and what they hope to do as well as further um, your organization's goals. So in terms of uh, moving from the mission and vision conversation, the other key pieces are to really understand what assets are being brought by both the congregation. You know, what, what do they have in terms of capacity and staff and members and volunteers and building resources and physical assets? Um, what is the overlap between what the church is attempting to do in the community and what your organization um, is also looking to promote and to advance? within a neighborhood or an area of the city. And the other final part of, of thinking through this initial steps in terms of developing collaboration is, is the process itself. Uh, this is kind of the nitty gritty. Uh, congregations are really interesting. They are also nonprofit uh, organizations uh, recognized by the IRS, but their um, polity, which is a technical word for how they're organized, um, can vary considerably. And, you know, they're mostly basically volunteer organizations, um, you know, that have, you know, may, could have hundreds of staff, uh, hundreds of volunteers, rather, uh, and maybe only a few staff. So 
Um, but the volunteers make up, in most cases, the governing body of the organization. So um, it's really important to think through how the process of talking about and planning the collaboration to start a market um, or implement a market is going to happen. So um, those key ingredients include, like I've, I've mentioned, the mission vision alignment, personal compatibility, you know, our is there really a rapport that's easily developed there? Are there? Is that going to work out? Because to be honest, we're all human, and if there isn't personal compatibility, we're looking at less chance of success, or at least in many cases, um, more difficulty in terms of navigating um, issues and identifying um, ways to move forward. Um, content, which in terms of food markets, content refers to what's going on. Um, in terms of the, the markets, this is an issue that's, that's pretty well understood. We're talking about food and providing food and fresh food and um, all of that to the community. So that's pretty um, uncontroversial or should be. Although as Nikki pointed out something really interesting, you know, um, at Devereaux uh, there is a concern about afford affordability. So the congregation was really on board with what was being provided, but it, in some ways it, it was, there is a question around access um, for people. And that was important to them and so important to people within the community that they hoped to serve by hosting the market. Decision-making process. I want to um, reiterate, this is the next point, decision-making process. That there are often, there's often a tendency to, this is sort of the proverbial way of putting it, kind of shake hands with the pastor and consider that a done deal. It, like I mentioned, each congregation, um, because of their denominations and traditions, governance works a little bit differently and it's really important to understand who, right from the beginning, who are the, who has authority to make decisions and uh, make agreements about using space, who manages space sharing um, within a congregation, and um, also how long does the process take? You know, a, a typical decision like that with a congregation, it, it may include an initial conversation with a pastor and a trustee and then a meeting with trustees and then a meeting with deacons and then a final Yes, for instance, you know that's just an example. So, and that may that process may take a month or two months, and that's not because anybody's dragging their feet, but that's just the nature of when meetings are held and how a process moves forward. So, it's really good to try and understand that right from the beginning and ask for a, a little bit of a roadmap, or to try and understand what the roadmap for that will look like and how long it'll take to make decisions and who are all going to be involved in making decisions. Finances is a really important one too. Um, congregations can be a little anxious about finances because obviously they're trying to do the most with the, the least in many cases and some congregations are facing um, some financial stresses in terms of their ability to really feel that they can um, address all of the issues that they need to with their finances. So being, being careful to really make clear what financial commitments may look like. Um, even in terms of you know upkeep and management of space that's used to support the market and physical space. Um, congregations love their buildings and love their spaces generally, and um, you know helping them really understand the impact to their space and nail down all of the details about how space will be used, who's going to be responsible on all sides for issues that arise from time to time because they do around space, um, you know, and who will be involved in troubleshooting and how troubleshooting around any issues that arise will work. That's really, really important. It gives congregations confidence and it helps them uh, more easily make the right decisions. And I think that um, we're going to turn it back to Nikki. Okay, that sounds good. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, 
Okay. So thanks, Josh, for outlining that um, and for emphasizing so much that um, it's important to know the decision-making process of um, the faith community you're working with. Um, on this slide, I've outlined the first few steps that folks can um, take when working with um, a house of worship. And um, the first one on there is um, an outreach and a coordinated communications plan. Um, you know, I think it's so important for uh, both the farmers market organizers and the um, the folks at the, in the faith community to know what's expected of both parties um, and how uh, the promotions of the markets are going to go and and that and um, programming on the ground too, as folks have um, capacity. But generally speaking, um, promotion of the market is key, and so a plan that outlines flyer distribution, um, listserv messages, newsletters, um, when the when um, pastors are going to talk about this during their sermons, um, any social media um, kind of posts going out there, um, it would be great to have it in the plan. Um, it, the plan can also include um, shared and individual goals and responsibilities. Um, Josh spent a lot of time talking about um, the, the missions and how um, it would be great if the missions aligned and that makes for really the most successful kind of project. Um, communication throughout the season is also important, not just within the plan that you've created with your partner, but informal communication about things that are really important to farmers markets like the weather, um, any special events that are happening in the community that you can either tap into um, to bring folks to the market or events around the community that are going to prevent farmers from um, setting up at the market. Um, communication with our partners on the ground is so important. Um, another way to tap into a congregation um, immediately is to see if there are any opportunities for volunteers to participate at the market. Um, frequently churches and synagogues will have um, a volunteer corps that you kind of reach out to and um, there they can also uh, be such a great source for publicity since word of mouth frequently is the best form of advertising for farmers markets. Um, and the last step that we thought was really important um, when working with uh, houses of worship is to integrate the farmers market with any programs or initiatives that are currently in existence there. Um, any meals programs, any clubs, any education happening, any after, um, after school care um, to be able to tap into those audiences and um, connect them to the market wherever possible, but at the very least publicize to those folks um, who are attending those programs that there is a market now that exists in their community. Um, I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to focus on an initiative that um, I think is pretty doable by most markets. Um, and it's something that you can organize on your own at the farmer's market. Um, the only thing you have to do is coordinate with a fresh food pantry. Um, we ran uh, an Eat Healthy and Give Healthy Fresh Produce Drive. It was developed by um, our Vista, who was with us um, in the past year, and we were able to run this for um, two holiday seasons. Um, the call to action for customers were to buy extra produce at the farmer's markets to donate to a fresh food pantry. And um, we would have a, a table there where they could donate the produce. Um, it was very simple to do because customers could buy and give at the same location. They didn't have to buy the food and then bring it somewhere else. Um, we found that it was really helpful to partner with a local organization. In this case, we partnered with the Coalition Against Hunger, who, um, among other things, run uh, provides support to a lot of the local pantries here in Philadelphia. Um, there's a timeline for the promotion and it starts about one month before the event and we have a template on how to run these fresh produce drives. Um, at the end, I'll have my contact information up and if anybody wants the template, I'm happy to send it to them. Um, we found that this kind of initiative worked best when it was staffed by two volunteers at the market and if those two volunteers could also do a little bit of work um, beforehand to um, create promotional materials. Um, and reach out to area partners, uh, that just makes the produce drive that much more successful. Um, so you can see a little flyer there advertising um, the one that we had at the Clark Park Farmers Market. Um, this is Jess from the, Co Jess from the Coalition Against Hunger um, collect collecting produce at our winter market. Um, we collected 455 pounds of produce 
at um, two farmers markets the week before Thanksgiving and um, the week before Christmas we collected 200 pounds of produce um, at a winter market that's at Clark Park over there uh, for those of you who are familiar with Philadelphia and um, the produce benefited five pantries hosted by communities um, and you know when you book those volunteers it might be uh, nice to book somebody with a car you can see it's overflowing um, we, heard, we had a lot of really good feedback from uh, those pantries. So we do plan to continue our work, um, our faith and food work, uh, you know, just like our, our poll kind of showed, um, although there are, there is a lot of connections between the food community and the faith community. Um, when we had a workshop earlier this year with um, partners, uh, we we sense from the audience that um, they felt like there was more potential to um, deepen these connections. And so we, we plan to continue to have more gatherings connecting um, faith and food access communities to kind of um, further discussion on where um, we can connect more. Uh, we want to continue to conduct tours of the markets um, as a way to introduce congregants in the community um, to the farmers markets and the resources there. Um, we'd like to continue our work with the youth and connect to more youth programming. Um, we find that they're a very effective voice in the community. Um, and we'd like to invite more community organizations to table at the markets as a resource to congregants and residents. Um, that's been very successful at our markets where that's been happening on a regular basis. Um, we also uh, found it very useful to, to strengthen the food buck partnerships um, in the faith community by um, increasing the amount of outreach that we're doing to um, faith organizations and um, we'd like to continue these food drives um, at this point we have a template for it um, and they, they kind of happen like clockwork when we can find um, the volunteers to run them um, if folks would like a template of that um, please do let me know and I'm happy to send it to you um, and finally you know we'd like to identify some funders that can help support and drive this faith and food partnerships that we think are so important um, you know, I was part of a survey gathering um, initiative from the Food Policy Council here in Philadelphia, and we had asked um, uh, attend, like survey participants if if they had a, a need for food or if they knew anybody who had a need for food, um, where would they send these folks? You know, thinking that they might send them to the local um, DHS office, um, but most of them sent church or a house of worship. Um, as Josh mentioned, the houses of worship. Um, tend to serve not just their own congregants, but the communities at large. And so we know that this is um, a great way to reach folks, and especially the folks who are most vulnerable, um, tend to, to know to reach out to um, a local house of worship in their faith communities. Um, I put a few resources up here that um, Joshua and I put together. Um, the Farmers Market Coalition, of course, um, and we thank them so much for hosting this webinar for us. Um, the USDA. Um, uh, which has funded um, the Farmers Market Promotion Program grant um, that allowed us to uh, deepen our work with the faith communities. Um, the Healthy Food Access Portal, I've also put their address there, healthyfoodaccess.org, um, highlights a lot of food projects um, that you can search for either in the topic of your interest or in your region. Um, Joshua's organization is sacredplaces.org, and um, you can find us at thefoodtrust.org. Um, if there are any questions, uh, Josh and I would be happy to, to answer any questions folks have. Great. Thank you guys so much. This was very informative. I especially liked what you just said, Nikki, about um, faith organizations being the place where people that are in need go first and that they know to do that. And that's a really good reason and, and incentive to connect with, with these organizations. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, the first question is for Joshua, and it's from Amanda, who is um, wondering, or she has a, a question about the report that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation. Um, she says, I'm interested in knowing more about how the value of churches was determined. What parameters did they use? And can she get a copy of that report? Is that something that you can share with the people that are um, registered for this? Sure, yeah. Um, it's called uh, Sacred Places at Risk. 
and either we can send it out, um, you know, uh, figure out how to send that out to the participants, or it's actually also available as a PDF file to be downloaded from our website. So if you go to Sacred Places, all lowercase one word, sacredplaces.org, um, it's available there. And it's again, it's called Sacred Places at Risk. Um, and that was the first step. We worked with academic research partners at the University of Pennsylvania who had been looking, who had, been, who had tools and methodology for calculating or measuring the economic dollar value effect of social service kinds of projects. And so adapted their methodologies and tools to um, measure what was happening in historic churches and congregations. And uh, some of that methodology has been available in, in a software program that we use in our training programs called uh, the Public Value Tool, um, which lets people input information and then the, it uses the methodology and the software um, is embedded to produce the values. Or um, actually in a study, our most recent national study, again with research partners at the University of Pennsylvania, um, called the Economic Halo Effect of Sacred Places. That study is, is finished and is actually all ready and is going to be debuting this fall. So if you check Partners website this fall, like in the next month, um, the Economic Halo Effect study will be available. Great. Um, so also, how are you guys defining success at these markets and are there any metrics that you're tracking? Sure, um, I can address that question. Um, we do survey um, at the farmers markets and we also collect sales and we have information on um, SNAP sales as well as um, general farmer sales as well. So um, that's generally how we're tracking this type of information. Are the farmers generating enough in sales to keep them returning? Um, they are. So uh, both the, the locations that I mentioned are now in their um, second and third years and we know that um, a large part of their success is, is due to the outreach that we've been doing um, through the congregants. Okay, great. Um, and do you, know, um, I, do you know what that percentage of um, sales from federal food assistance programs is? You know, I don't have um, the full numbers for this season yet because we're still in September, but we do know that um, at one of our locations at the Fair Hill Farmers Market, the farmer has, and it's the same farmer that uh, um, attends the 26 and Allegheny Market, and she has told us that depending on the, the time of the month, um, sometimes her sales are up to 50% from benefits, and that means um, EBT sales, Farmers Market Nutrition Program vouchers, and um, food bucks. Great. Do you guys have any other examples about how youth are connecting with um, this kind of programming? You know, we've had a few um, youth organizations connect to our farmers markets. Um, at the Common Ground Market, there was a bicycle group that was leading um, bike tours to um, a few urban farms that were in bikeable distance to the market. One of them was in the rooftop on Cloud Nine. Um, and the other one was called Urbanstead. Um, and then, as I mentioned, a few of the HYPE students who work with our HYPE programming here at the Food Trust um, went to visit a few markets as well over the summer uh, as, part of some, uh, as part of some summer programming. Um, that's really cool. Um, hmm. Okay, so I have an, uh, one more question from Jay. So if anybody else has a question, please um, type it in now. Um, one of the first things you said was that it's important to host markets when and where it's convenient for customers. And um, in Center County, Pennsylvania, where this um, person is, um, the farmers insist on hours that are convenient for them. Consequently, it's difficult for working it's difficult for working consumers to shop at the market. So what advice do you have for getting the producers on board? Different perspective, how do you make it convenient for the farmers to participate in a Sunday market or um, sure. during 
other hours? Well, I think, um, you know, before I approach a farmer to recruit them for a farmer's market, um, I want to know the congregation really well and the community really really well so that when um, I speak to the farmer, when they ask me, you know, when they tell me how much it costs for them to come to market and, the, you know, um, the mileage and the picking and the packing of the produce and what their break-even point is, um, I want to be able to say to them, you know, I've been working with this congregation and we've been going, you know, we've been having um, weeknight meetings and they're heavily attended. Um, Farmers want to know that they're going to have a customer base that's going to buy that that will want to do their weekly shopping with them, and that they're buying you know groceries and not you know snacks for the day and that kind of thing. So, um, so I think meeting with the congregation, um, and I think Josh had also mentioned this a lot in his presentation, um, and getting to know them and knowing like what kind of products they're hoping to see at their farmers markets will allow you to have um, good communication with the farmer to kind of know if your expectations or his expectations are the same and um, it, it's really cultivating that relationship um, and you know when we can we um, try to introduce the farmer right away to the community so that they um, get to know each other and they understand, the community understands how important it is for them to come to the market and um, and the farmer also understands that a community is counting on them to come to market to you know provide them with their weekly groceries so I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Nikki, what are some of the questions that you ask on your market surveys? Um, I'm not sure if, if it's something that is specific for um, working with faith communities or sure if folks, uh, yeah if folks have um you know any questions about that they can email me and I'm happy to send them a template but we do an end of year survey at all of our farmers markets it's about three pages and mm -hmm. um, there's some you know we ask some demographic questions but a lot of it is around um, eating behavior and how um, the farmers market you know the farmers market encourage you to to eat a wider variety of fruits and vegetables, um, how, you know, a, a lot of times we find that farmers markets end up being a hub for the community and we found through survey, surveying folks that um, the farmers market actually makes them feel better about their community um, and it becomes a place where they can um, gather um, and meet other um, folks who are trying to work on organizing the same things that they're organizing on. Mm -hmm. So I can send folks, um, so it's a three-page uh, survey that covers a lot of different things and for folks who are interested, I'm happy to send them um, a template of it. That's really nice. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think that is it for the questions. A couple of people asked about the recording and the PowerPoint, which we will be providing. Um, so that will go out to you via a link in the next couple of days. And, um, if you guys have any other questions, you can email Nikki or Joshua or me. I'm Liz at FarmersMarketCoalition.org. And um, we really thank everybody for joining us. Um, this was a great presentation. Do you guys have anything else to add? No, I think I'm, I'm set. Really <laughs> okay. glad that everybody came out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Keep up the good work. and. Um, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.